I'm going to present to you a game uh, called Moji. Uh, we built this game together with my wife, uh, who is here. <laughs> See? Um, and, and we built this game for a uh, low resolution gem. Uh, so it's 64 by 64 pixels, and we built it in Elm. So uh, in my abstract, I told, told that I'm going to demo it in the end, but I think it makes sense to do the demo, uh, to start with the demo. So, um, so in, in this game, you, you play this uh, little yellow alien, and uh, there is a monster, a purple monster, that runs after you, so it's a changing platformer game. Um, in, in the top left corner, you see lives, then uh, uh, then goes the score, which is how many uh, screens you passed. And in the top right, right corner, there is a minimap. So the goal in this game is to make it as further as you can, uh, while the speed of monster progressively increases until, uh, until the monster hits you, and, and then you're dead. <laughs> so. Uh, this is pretty much it, um, and I'm going to talk, um, I'm going to start the slide, so I'm uh, ending the game and turning off the sound, so. Uh, and this is my presentation. Uh, it's called uh, Moji or how we fit Elm uh, in a 64 by 64 pixels grid. So I want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, while working in this game, we have created a pixel font and uh, we, so we could use all the resources, and it seemed totally, totally reasonable to also build my slides inside the game. Uh, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, I want to uh, introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Andrei Kuzmin uh, on Soundscapes on Twitter, and I work at SoundCloud as a front-end engineer. Uh, I, so I want to start this talk with uh, maybe a little known fact. Uh, back in 2013, uh, uh, John Carmack uh, presented at a QuakeCon uh, where he told that he tried to uh, rebuild Wolfenstein in Haskell. And he spoke about benefits of strongly typed uh, functional programming, so specifically refactoring um, and and a compiler catching a lot of errors before you. Uh, so which also brings us to Elm, because Elm is also a strongly typed functional language, uh, so we can play with all these ideas in Elm. Uh, but for me, why I started building games in Elm was because I first wanted to learn the language, so I created something for fun. Uh, but then the fun kept going on, so I couldn't stop doing this. Uh, and uh, it's actually it's, it's pretty good because uh, you have the full setup, you have all the tools, uh, so you can immediately see the results on the screen. Um, and also, uh, you don't waste time. So when building games in something else, you spend more time playing the games and debugging them. While in Elm, you spend less time playing your games, you spend more time actually developing them. Um, so I, I built a few games, so starting with uh, Flatter's game, uh, the game that you can see on the homepage of the Elm language. Uh, and, and then later, at my, with my former colleagues, we built a, 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 a point-and-click fashion delivery simulator called Elm Street 404. And Moji is the latest game that I created. So with every new game, I faced more and more challenges because uh, things have become more and more dynamic. Uh, so, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the challenges. Uh, so hopefully, when you would like to create a game, uh, you will know like, what things you will be facing ahead of time. Uh, so I split the challenges into three uh, categories. Uh, so the game state, uh, interactions, and rendering. And now if you, see, if you look at all of them, they would correspond to model, uh, update, and view in, in the Elm architecture. 
Um, so starting with the game state, uh, I guess it's the most important thing because the way you, the way you model the game has the highest impact o on, on the code that you write. So uh, the code complexity may change a lot depending on how you desi design the model. Um, and also in games, it has a huge impact over the speed, the performance of the game. Uh, so uh, you all may have heard of uh, time traveling Mario. And in this example, we only have a single entity. And uh, so it's, it's kind of easy to describe it. So we describe Mario with uh, direction, where Mario faces uh, vertical and horizontal velocity components and uh, coordinates. Uh, but what happens if you want a more entities and you want a different entities in the game? Uh, so this is a schematic representation of Elm Street 404, where we have created warehouses, houses, and trees, and put them on the map. And all these objects, they are different, uh, but they have to be drawn in, in, in the same space. Uh, so we kind of chose to model it in a very naive way. Uh, we modeled them as uh, just three lists of things. Um, and there were parts of the code where we needed to work with all of them. For example, in the pathfinding algorithm uh, where we need to have uh, positions and uh, sizes of all objects. Uh, so we had to write a function that would I extract this information from all these lists and put it into one single list so that then the algorithm can use it. Uh, so this wasn't nice. And then when we wanted to randomize the objects on the map, we really needed to have all these entities in a single list. Uh, so we just did this, and we have created a single entity type, and we extracted uh, common properties such as size and position, and we kept uh, varying pieces in uh, a separate category field. And uh, we defined the category field using uh, union type. So category is either a warehouse or a house or a tree. And warehouse and house can store uh, information specific to these entities. Uh, so in the Moji game, I first started with the same approach. Uh, so in Moji, there are three uh, elements in the, in the game, uh, moji, uh, a screen. So a screen is a square part, a square segment of the map, and a wall. Uh, but unfortunately, this wasn't uh, nice. And in some cases, uh, I needed to calculate uh, screen offset, uh, depending on the moji position. So what I had to do is loop over the whole uh, list of entities, and then find Moji, and then get Moji's position. Um, and uh, during uh, at, uh, Elm Europe conference, I, I watched uh, Jeff Schumay talk, where he mentioned a thing called uh, Entity Component System. So it's, a, it's a, an, a pattern that is used in game development, and it allows you to uh, split an entity into different components that uh, describe uh, different pieces of information. Um, and then you could just compose entities using this uh, different pieces of information. Um, and a system is uh, something that does the business logic, so it's something that is triggered on entities having certain components. So. Uh, the, uh, so you may wonder uh, how can this be done in Elm, and, and there, there are libraries uh, implementing this approach, but I chose to go uh, with, like, to roll my own solution to this, and uh, the way I did this was uh, through creating a record and then having a dictionary, a separate dictionary for each component. So whenever I want to create a new entity, I simply increment the unique ID. And then uh, using this ID, I add uh, certain pieces of information for this entity into different dictionaries. So in this case, uh, an entity is just an integer. It's just an ID. Uh, 
so these are the components that are in the game, and uh, some of them are named after uh, corresponding entities. Uh, so that's because they store entity-specific information. So for example, the way I defined Moji entity is by creating Moji component, uh, velocity component, and transform component. So with this approach, whenever I need to calculate screen offset, I can look into a dictionary that stores Moji and I get Moji ID from there. And then using this idea, I can do lookup in the uh, transform component to get the position. And, and uh, so I don't have to loop over the whole entities in the game. Uh, so the second challenge was uh, doing interactions. And you may wonder, why is this difficult? Um, and the answer to this is uh, immutability. Because in purely interact uh, imperative programming, when um, an entity interacts with the world or two entities interact with each other, just both, both of them mutate, uh, while uh, in purely functional immutable uh, uh, paradigm, what you have to do uh, when entity interacts with the world, it results in a new world containing like a new updated copy of the entity. So let's recap what are the interactions in the game. Uh, so in the game, there's a sequence of screens. They are numbered. And the, there is one screen that is active, and it collapses. And uh, every time in, in the animation loop, I have to run this collapsing uh, business logic. And then I collide all the walls with screens. And if the walls do not collide with screens, I remove them from the game. And when Mojo does not collide with a screen, uh, Mojo dies. Uh, so the challenging thing here is that by the end of the animation loop, the model has to be in the correct state. Um, otherwise, it may result in bugs. So uh, for example, like this. Uh, so the reason why this happened is because I first collided walls with screens. So I see that they did collide. And then I removed the screen that was collapsed. So for just one frame, there was a flash of uh, hanging walls in the space. Um, and actually, Elm Debugger was, was pretty helpful into tackling down this bug. Uh, so when I moved to Entity Component System, I, I kind of isolated all the uh, business logic that I do on the screens and then uh, on the walls. And I, I wrote them in, in the exact order. Uh, uh, but uh, also, there is a nice uh, blog post about this by Patrick Dubrow. It's called Immutability is Not Enough. And uh, in this article, Patrick proposes uh, uh, using, uh, uh, using effects to do this. And uh, he describes an effect as uh, a piece of information that uh, explains the desired state change. So instead of, instead of updating things, instead of updating your entities, you return a list of events of what has happened uh, during the cycle. And then you can traverse these events. You can prioritize them. And then using these events, you will update the whole state of the world in the game. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to play with this. This is something that I will do in the future. And in the meantime, we were mainly focused on improving the graphics and the game itself. And the, uh, this, which brings us to the last challenge, which is rendering. Uh, so starting with, like, here is a game texture. Uh, and starting from Elm Street 404, I started using WebGL to render the games. And the, I guess the most challenging thing in, in order to do 2D graphics is to map uh, mesh onto a texture. So everything in the game is just two triangles uh, forming a rectangle. Another challenge here was to render a monster. And uh, in this case, we wanted to be very efficient 
in, to use this texture, so we decided to split horizontal and vertical pieces of the monster. Um, and the challenging thing here was to map from the monster state, or the monster is like, it's basically the screen that is currently animating, onto which um, frame to choose from the texture. So, so I have uh, said I have talked about the challenges that I faced, and hopefully it would be easier for you uh, to work on your game. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, there are two uh, Slack channels on the Elm Slack. One called Game Dev, and another web gel where you may ask questions, and people are very helpful there. Uh, so, uh, from my side, I, I have a few advices for you. Uh, one is not to not work on the game engine, but rather work on the game because Elm is pretty good at in uh, mapping uh, domain values. Uh, and if you build a wall of abstraction, it will be more complicated because you don't know what the abstractions should be up front. Um, and then another uh, second advice is that if you want to uh, uh, work on the game, uh, you should focus more on the progress on the game rather than on making your code nice. Uh, so it, in some places, it's just good to like dirty code things and then come back to it later, and then refactor, because Elm compiler helps you with this, and you shouldn't worry about writing bad code, because everything is type checked. And the last advice is uh, don't put your slides onto 64 by 64 pixels, great. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you.